On the mountains of the prairie, on the great red pipestone quarry, Gitche Manito the mighty, he the master of life descending on the red crags of the quarry, stood erect and called the nations, called the tribes of men together. Down the rivers or the prairies came the warriors of the nations, with their weapons and their war gear, painted like the leaves of autumn, painted like the sky of morning wildly glaring at each other. In their faces, stern defiance. In their hearts, the feuds of ages, the hereditary hatred, the ancestral thirst of vengeance. Gitche Manito, the mighty, the creator of the nations, looked upon them with compassion, with paternal love and pity, looked upon their wrath and wrangling, but as quarrels among children, but as feuds and fights of children. Over them he stretched his right hand to subdue their stubborn natures, spake to them with voice majestic as the sound of far-off waters falling into deep abysses, warning, chiding, spake in this wise. Oh, my children, my poor children, listen to the words of wisdom, listen to the words of warning from the lips of the great spirit, from the master of life who made you. I have given you lands to hunt in. I have given you streams to fish in. I have given you bear and bison. Fill the marshes full of wildfowl. Fill the rivers full of fishes. Why then are you not contented? Why then will you hunt each other? I am weary of your quarrels, weary of your wars and bloodshed. All your strength is in your union, all your danger is in discord. Therefore, be at peace henceforward, and as brothers live together. I will send a prophet to you, a deliverer of the nations, who shall guide you and shall teach you, who shall toil and suffer with you. If you listen to his counsels, you will multiply and prosper. If his warnings pass unheeded, you will fade away and perish. Smoke the pipe of peace together, and as brothers, live henceforward. Then upon the ground, the warriors threw their cloaks and shirts of deer skin, threw their weapons and their war gear, leapt into the rushing river, washed the war paint from their faces. Clear above them flowed the water, clear and limpid from the footprints of the master of life descending. Dark below them flowed the water, soiled and stained with streaks of crimson, as if blood were mingled with it. And in silence, all the warriors broke the red stone from the quarry, smoothed and formed it into peace pipes, and departed each one homeward while the master of life ascending through the opening of cloud curtains, through the doorways of the heaven, vanished from before their faces. In the smoke that rolled around him, the Pokwana of the peace pipe. Downward through the evening twilight, in the days that are forgotten, in the unremembered ages, from the full moon fell Nokomis, fell the beautiful Nokomis, she a wife, but not a mother. Downward through the evening twilight, on the musco day, the meadow, on the prairie full of blossoms, said the people, there among the prairie lilies, on the musco day, the meadow, in the moonlight and the starlight, fair Nokomis bore a daughter, and she called her name Wenona. The daughter of Nokomis grew up like the prairie lilies, grew a tall and slender maiden with the beauty of the moonlight, with the beauty of the starlight. And Nokomis warned her often, saying oft and oft repeating, Oh, beware of Mujekiwis, of the west wind, Mujekiwis. Listen not to what he tells you. Lie not down upon the meadow. Stoop not down among the lilies, lest the west wind come and harm you. But she heeded not the warning. 
heeded not those words of wisdom, and the west wind came at evening, walking lightly o'er the prairie, whispering to the leaves and blossoms, found the beautiful Winona, lying there among the lilies, wooed her with his words of sweetness, wooed her with his soft caresses, till she bore a son in sorrow, bore a son of love and sorrow. Thus was born my Hiawatha. Thus was born the child of wonder. But the daughter of Nokomis, Hiawatha's gentle mother, in her anguish died, deserted by the west wind, false and faithless, by the heartless Mojikiwis. For her daughter long and loudly wailed and wept the sad Nokomis. Oh, that I were dead, she murmured. Oh, that I were dead as thou art. Waho no win. Waho no win. Waho no win. Waho no win. By the shores of Gichigumi, by the shining big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon, Nokomis. Dark behind it rose the forest, rose the black and gloomy pine trees. Bright before it beat the water, beat the shining big sea water. There the wrinkled old Nokomis nursed the little Hiawatha, rocked him in his linden cradle, bedded soft in moss and rushes, safely bound with reindeer sinews. Hush! The naked bear will hear thee. Lulled him into slumber, singing, Hewea, my little owlet, Who is this that lights the wigwam? With his great eyes lights the wigwam. Hewea, my little owlet. Many things Nokomis taught him, of the stars that shine in heaven. Showed him Ishkuda the comet, Ishkuda with fiery tresses, flaring far away to northward in the frosty nights of winter. Showed the broad, wide road in heaven, the pathway of the ghosts, the shadows, running straight across the heavens, crowded with the ghosts, the shadows. At the door on summer evenings sat the little Hiawatha, heard the whispering of the pine trees, heard the lapping of the water, saw the firefly, Wawa Tesi, flitting through the dusk of evening with the twinkle of its candle lighting up the brakes and bushes. And he sang the song of children, sang the song Nokomis taught him. Wawetisi, little firefly, little flitting white fire insect, little dancing white fire creature, light me with your little candle. Hair upon my bed I lay me, hair in sleep. Of all beasts he learned the language, learned their names and all their secrets, how the beavers built their lodges, where the squirrels hid their acorns, how the reindeer ran so swiftly, why the rabbit was so timid. Talked with them whene'er he met them, called them... Hi, what is brothers? Then Iago, the great boaster, he, the marvellous storyteller, he, the traveller and the talker, made a bow for Hiawatha. From a branch of ash he made it. From an oak bough made the arrows, tipped with flint and winged with feathers, and the cord he made of deer skin. Go, my son, into the forest, where the red deer herd together. Kill for us a famous roebuck, 
kill for us a deer with antlers. Forth into the forest straightway, all alone walked Hiawatha, proudly with his bow and arrows, till he saw two antlers lifted, saw two eyes look from the thicket, and his heart within him fluttered, trembled like the leaves above him as the deer came down the pathway. Then, upon one knee uprising, Hiawatha aimed an arrow. Scarce a twig moved with his motion, scarce a leaf was stirred or rustled. But the wary roebuck started, leapt as if to meet the arrow. Ah, the singing fatal arrow. Dead he lay there in the forest, beat his timid heart no longer. But the heart of Hiawatha throbbed and shouted and exulted. As he bore the red deer homeward, and Iago and Nokomis hailed his coming with applauses. All the village came and feasted. All the guests praised Hiawatha, called him Strongheart, Songetaha. <laughs> Out of childhood into manhood now had grown my Hiawatha. Much he questioned old Nokomis of his father, Mojakiwis learned from her the fatal secret of the beauty of his mother, of the falsehood of his father. And his heart was hot within him, like a living coal his heart was. I will go to Mudjikiwis, see how fares it with my father, at the doorways of the west wind, at the portals of the sunset. From his lodge went Hiawatha, dressed in deerskin shirt and leggings, richly wrought with quills and wampum, in his hand, his bow of ash wood, strung with sinews of the reindeer. In his quiver, oaken arrows, tipped with jasper, winged with feathers. Go not forth, O Hiawatha, to the realms of Mujakiwis, lest he harm you with his magic, lest he kill you with his cunning. But the fearless Hiawatha heeded not her woman's warnings. Forth he strode into the forest, at each stride a mile he measured. So he journeyed westward, westward, came unto the rocky mountains, where upon the gusty summits sat the ancient Mujikiwis, ruler of the winds of heaven. Filled with awe was Hiawatha at the aspect of his father. On the air about him wildly tossed and streamed his cloudy tresses, gleamed like drifting snow his tresses, glared like Ishkudar the comet, like the star with fiery tresses. <laughs> Filled with joy was Mujakiwis when he looked on Hiawatha, saw his youth rise up before him in the face of Hiawatha, saw the beauty of Winona from the grave rise up before him. Welcome, my son Hiawatha, to the kingdom of the West Wind. Long have I been waiting for you. Youth is lovely, age is lonely. Youth is fiery, age is frosty. You bring back my youth of passion and the beautiful Wenona. Many days they talked together. Much the mighty Mujikiwis boasted of his ancient prowess. Patiently sat Hiawatha. With a smile he sat and listened, uttered neither threat nor menace. Neither word nor look betrayed him, but his heart was hot within him, like a living coal his heart was. Then he said, Oh, Mujikiwis, is there nothing that can harm you? There is nothing, Hiawatha, nothing but the black rock yonder, nothing but the fatal war beak. And he looked at Hiawatha, saying, Oh, my Hiawatha, is there anything can harm you? Anything you are afraid of? But the wary Hiawatha paused a while as if uncertain, held his peace as if resolving, and then answered, There is nothing, nothing but the bulrush yonder, nothing but the great Apuqua. Then they talked of other matters, talked of Hiawatha's mother, of the beautiful Winona, of her birth upon the meadow, of her death as old Nokomis had remembered and related. Oh, my father, Majikiwis, it was you who killed Winona, took her young life and her beauty, broke the lily of the prairie, trampled it beneath your footsteps. You confess it, you confess it. And the mighty Majikiwis, 
tossed his grey hairs to the west wind, bowed his hoary head in anguish, with a silent nod assented. Then up started Hiawatha, and with threatening look and gesture, laid his hand upon the black rock, on the fatal war peak laid it, rent the jutting crag asunder, smote and crushed it into fragments, hurled them madly at his father, for his heart was hot within him, like a living coal his heart was. But the ruler of the west wind blew the fragments backward from him, with the breathing of his nostrils, with the tempest of his anger, seized the bulrush, the apokwa, dragged it with its roots and fibers from the margin of the meadow, from its ooze, the giant bulrush. Then began the deadly conflict, hand to hand among the mountains. Like a tall tree in the tempest, bent and lashed the giant bulrush, and in masses huge and heavy, crashing fell the fatal war beak. Till the earth shook with the tumult and confusion of the battle, and the thunder of the mountains starting answered, Mine. Back retreated Machikiwis, stumbling westward down the mountains. Three whole days retreated fighting, still pursued by Hiawatha, to the doorways of the west wind, to the earth's remotest border, where into the empty spaces sinks the sun as a flamingo drops into her nest at nightfall in the melancholy marshes. Hold! At length cried Mojakiris. <laughs> Hold, my son, my Hiawatha. It is impossible to kill me. I have put you to this trial, but to know and prove your courage. Now receive the prize of valor. Go back to your home and people, cleanse the earth from all that harms it. And at last, when death draws near you, when the awful eyes of Pauguk glare upon you in the darkness, I will share my kingdom with you. Ruler shall you be thenceforward of the northwest wind, Kiwaiden. Homeward now went Hiawatha. Pleasant was the landscape round him. Pleasant was the air above him. For the bitterness of anger had departed wholly from him. From his brain the thought of vengeance. From his heart the burning fever. Only once his paces slackened. Paused to purchase heads of arrows of the ancient arrow maker in the land of the Dakotas. Where the falls of Minnehaha flash and gleam among the oak trees. Laugh and leap into the valley. There the ancient arrow maker made his arrowheads of sandstone, smoothed and sharpened at the edges, hard and polished, keen and costly. With him dwelt his dark-eyed daughter, wayward as the Minnehaha, with her moods of shade and sunshine, eyes that smiled and frowned alternate, feet as rapid as the river, tresses flowing like the water, and as musical a laughter. And he named her from the river, from the waterfall he named her, Minnehaha, Laughing Water. All he told to old Nokomis when he reached the lodge at sunset was the meeting with his father, was his fight with Mujakiwis. Not a word he said of arrows, not a word of Laughing Water. Forth upon the Gichigumi, on the shining big sea water, with his fishing line of cedar, forth to catch the sturgeon, Nama. Mishe Nama, king of fishes. In his birch canoe, exulting, all alone went Hiawatha. Through the clear, transparent water, he could see the fishes swimming. On the white sand of the bottom lay the monster, Mishe Nama. There he lay in all his armor plates of bone upon his forehead, down his sides and back and shoulders, plates of bone with spines projecting. Painted was he with his war paints, stripes of yellow, red and azure, spots of brown and spots of sable. Take my bait, cried Hiawatha, and he dropped his line of cedar through the clear transparent water. 
take my bait, O oh, sturgeon Nama. Come up from below the water. Let us see which is the stronger. Quiet lay the sturgeon Nama, fanning slowly in the water. Looking up at Hiawatha, listening to his call and clamor, till he wearied of the shouting, said to Ugodwash the sunfish, Take the bait of this great boaster, break the line of Hiawatha. Slowly upward, wavering, gleaming, like a white moon in the water, rose the Ugodwash the sunfish, seized the line of Hiawatha, swung with all his weight upon it, made a whirlpool in the water, whirled the birch canoe in circles, round and round in gurgling eddies. But when Hiawatha saw him, slowly rising through the water, lifting his great disc of whiteness, loud he shouted in derision, Isa, Isa, shame upon you! You are Ugudwash the sunfish, you are not the fish I wanted! You are not the king of fishes! Slowly downward, wavering, gleaming, sank the Ugudwash the sunfish. And again the sturgeon, Nana, heard the shout of Hiawatha, heard his challenge of defiance ringing far across the water. From the white sand of the bottom, up he rose with angry gesture, quivering in each nerve and fiber, clashing all his plates of armor. In his wrath he darted upward, flashing, leapt into the sunshine, opened his great jaws, and swallowed both canoe and Hiawatha. Down into that darksome cavern plunged the headlong Hiawatha as a log on some black river shoots and plunges down the rapids, found himself in utter darkness, groped about in helpless wonder, till he felt a great heart beating, throbbing in that utter darkness, and he smote it. With his fist, the heart of Nala felt the mighty king of fishes shudder through each nerve and fiber, Heard the water gurgle around him as he leapt and staggered through it. And again, that sturgeon, Nama, gasped and quivered in the water. Then was still, and drifted landward, till he grated on the pebbles, till the listening Hiawatha heard him grate upon the margin, felt him strand upon the pebbles, knew that Nama, king of fishes, lay there dead upon the margin. Then he heard a clang and flapping as of many wings assembling, heard a screaming and confusion as of birds of prey contending, saw a gleam of light above him shining through the ribs of Nama, saw the glittering eyes of seagulls, heard them saying to each other, and he shouted from below them, cried exulting from the caverns, O oh, ye seagulls! Oh, my brothers, I have slain the sturgeon Nama. Make the rifts a little larger. With your claws, the openings widen. Set me free from this dark prison. And the wild and clamorous seagulls toiled with beak and claws together, made the rifts and openings wider in the mighty ribs of Nama, and from peril and from prison was released by Hiawatha. He was standing near his wigwam, on the margin of the water, and he called to old Nokomis. I have slain the Mishinama. Look, the seagulls feed upon him. Wait until their meal is ended, till their craws are full with feasting. Then bring all your pots and kettles and make oil for us in winter. Three whole days and nights alternate, old Nokomis and the seagulls stripped the oily flesh of Nama till the waves washed through the rib bones, till the seagulls came no longer. And upon the sands lay nothing but the skeleton of Nama. As unto the bow the cord is, so unto the man is woman. Though she bends him, she obeys him. Though she draws him, Yet she follows, useless each without the other. Thus the youthful Hiawatha said within himself, and pondered. Much perplexed by various feelings, 
listless, longing, hoping, fearing, dreaming still of Minnehaha in the land of the Dakotas. Wed a maiden of your people. Warning, said the old Nokomis. Bring not to my lodge a stranger from the land of the Dakotas. Often is there war between us. There are feuds yet unforgotten, wounds that ache and still may open. For that reason, if no other would I wed the fair Dakota, that our tribes might be united, that old feuds might be forgotten and old wounds be healed forever. Thus departed Hiawatha to the land of the Dakotas, to the land of handsome women, striding over moor and meadow. Yet the way seemed long before him, and his heart outran his footsteps. And he journeyed without resting, till he heard the cataract's thunder, heard the falls of Minnehaha. At the doorway of his wigwam sat the ancient arrow maker in the land of the Dakotas, making arrowheads of jasper. At his side, in all her beauty, sat the lovely Minnehaha, plaiting mats of flags and rushes. Of the past, the old man's thoughts were, and the maidens of the future. On the mat, her hands lay idle, and her eyes were very dreamy. Through their thoughts, they heard a footstep, heard a rustling in the branches, and with glowing cheek and forehead, suddenly from out the woodlands, oh. Hiawatha stood before them. Straight the ancient arrow maker looked up gravely from his labor, bade him enter the doorway. Hiawatha, you are welcome. And the maiden looked up at him, looked up from her mat of rushes, said with gentle look and accent, You are welcome, Hiawatha. Then uprose the laughing water, from the ground, fair Minnehaha laid aside her mat unfinished, brought forth food and set before them. Water brought them from the brooklet, listened while the guest was speaking. Yes, as in a dream she listened to the words of Hiawatha. After many years of warfare, many years of strife and bloodshed, there is peace between my people and the tribe of the Dakotas. That this peace may last forever and our hearts be more united, Give me as my wife this maiden, Minnehaha, laughing water, loveliest of Dakota women. Yes, if Minnehaha wishes, let your heart speak, Minnehaha. And the lovely laughing water seemed more lovely as she stood there. As she went to Hiawatha, softly took the seat beside him. I will follow you, my husband. From the wigwam he departed, leading with him laughing water. Hand in hand they went together through the woodland and the meadow. Thus it was that Hiawatha, to the lodge of old Nokomis, brought the moonlight, starlight, firelight, brought the sunshine of his people. Minnehaha, laughing water, handsomest of all the women in the land of the Dakotas, in the land of handsome women. <laughs> Sumptuous was the feast Nokomis made at Hiawatha's wedding. She had sent through all the village messengers with wands of willow, and the wedding guests assembled, clad in all their richest raiment, robes of fur and belts of wampum, splendid with their paint and plumage. First they ate the sturgeon, Nama, then on pemmican they feasted. Haunch of deer and hump of bison, yellow cakes of the Mondamin and the wild rice of the river. Little heeded he their jesting, cared he for their insults, for the women and the maidens loved the handsome Paupo Kiwis. On his head were plumes of swans down, on his heels were tails of foxes, in one hand a fan of feathers, and a pipe was in the other, as among the guests assembled to the sounds of flutes and singing, to the sound of drums and voices, rose the handsome Paupo Kiwis and began his mystic dances. 
First he danced a solemn measure, very slow in step and gesture, in and out among the pine trees, through the shadows and the sunshine, treading softly like a panther. Then, more swiftly and still swifter, whirling, spinning round in circles, leaping all the guests assembled, eddying round and round the wigwam till the leaves went whirling with him. Then along the sandy margin of the lake, the big sea water, on he sped with frenzied gestures till the dust and wind together swept in eddies round about him. Thus the very powerful Kiwis danced his beggar's dance to please them. And returning, sat down laughing there among the guests assembled, sat and fanned himself serenely with his fan of turkey feathers. Then they said to Chibiabos, to the friend of Hiawatha, Sing to us, O Chibiabos, songs of love and songs of longing. <laughs> Most beloved by Hiawatha was the gentle Chibiabos, he the best of all musicians, he the sweetest of all singers. Beautiful and childlike was he, brave as man is, soft as woman, pliant as a wand of willow, stately as a deer with antlers. When he sang, the village listened. All the warriors gathered round him, all the women came to hear him. Now he stirred their souls to passion, now he melted them to pity. And the gentle Chibiabos sang in accents sweet and tender songs of love, and songs of longing, looking still at Hiawatha, looking at fair laughing water. On a wake, a wake, beloved, thou the wild flower of the forest, thou the wild bird of the prairie, thou with eyes so soft and fawn like. Smiles the earth and smile the waters, smile the cloudless skies above us. But I lose the way of smiling when thou art no longer near me. I myself, myself behold me, blood of my beating heart. Behold me, on a way, awake, beloved, on a way, awake, beloved. All the many sounds of nature borrowed sweetness from his singing. All the hearts of men were softened by the pathos of his music, for he sang of peace and freedom, sang of beauty, love and longing, sang of death and life undying in the islands of the blessed, in the kingdom of Ponema, in the land of the hereafter. Such was Hiawatha's wedding, such the dance of Paupok Kiwis, such the songs of Chibiabos. Thus the wedding banquet ended and the wedding guests departed, leaving Hiawatha happy with the night and Minnehaha. And the war cry was forgotten, there was peace among the nations. Sing, O song of Hiawatha, of the happy days that followed in the pleasant land and peaceful. Unmolested roved the hunters, built the birch canoe for sailing, caught the fish in lake and river, shot the deer and trapped the beaver. Unmolested worked the women, made their sugar from the maple, gathered wild rice in the meadows, dressed the skins of deer and beaver. But in search of new adventures, from his lodge went Paupo Kiwis, came with speed into the village, found the young men all assembled in the lodge of Old Iago, listening to his monstrous stories. Very boastful was Iago. Never heard he an adventure but himself admit a greater. Never any deed of daring but himself had done a bolder. Never any marvellous story but himself could tell a stranger. Hark you! shouted Paupo Kiwis as he entered at the doorway. I'm tired of all this talking, tired of old Iago's stories, tired of Hiawatha's wisdom. Here is something to amuse you better than this endless talking. Then from out his pouch of wolfskin, forth he drew with solemn manner 
all the game of bowl and counters. Puga sang with 13 pieces. In a wooden bowl he placed them, shook and jostled them together. Thus he taught the game of hazard, thus displayed it and explained it, running through its various chances. Twenty curious eyes stared at him, full of eagerness stared at him. Many games, said old Iago. Many games of skill and hazard have I seen in different nations. Though you think yourself so skillful, I can beat you, Paupokiwis. I can even give you lessons in your game of bowl and counters. <laughs> so they sat and played together. All the old men and the young men played for dresses, weapons, wampum, played till midnight, played till morning, till the cunning Paupokiwis of their treasures had despoiled them. Twenty eyes glared wildly at him, like the eyes of wolves glared at him. In my wigwam, I am lonely. I have need of a companion. Fain would have a Meshinawa, an attendant and pipe bearer. I will venture all these winnings, all these garments heaped about me, all this wampum, all these feathers, on a single throw will venture all against the young man yonder. <laughs> It was a youth of sixteen summers. It was a nephew of Iago. Face in a mist, the people called him. As the fire burns in a pipe head, dusky red beneath the ashes, so beneath his shaggy eyebrows glowed the eyes of old Iago. Seized the wooden bowl, the old man, closely in his bony fingers, shook it fiercely and with fury, made the pieces ring together and he threw them down before him. <sighs> Only five the pieces counted. Then the smiling Paupok Kiwis shook the bowl and threw the pieces. Lightly in the air he tossed them, stood alone among the players, saying, Five tens! Mine the game is! <laughs> Twenty eyes glared at him fiercely, like the eyes of wolves glared at him as he turned and left the wigwam followed by his Meshinoa, by the nephew of Iago, by the tall and graceful stripling, bearing in his arms the winnings, shirts of deerskins, robes of ermine, belts of wampum, pipes and weapons. Hot and red with smoke and gambling were the eyes of Paupo Kiwis as he came forth to the freshness of the pleasant summer morning. All the birds were singing gaily, all the streamlets flowing swiftly, and the heart of Paupok Kiwis sang with pleasure as the birds sing, beat with triumph like the streamlets. As he wandered through the village in the early grey of morning with his fan of turkey feathers, with his plumes and tufts of swans down, till he reached the farthest wigwam, reached the lodge of Hiawatha. With a stealthy step he entered. All are gone. The lodge is empty. Gone is weary Hiawatha. Gone the silly laughing water. Gone Nokomis, the old woman. And the lodge is left unguarded. <laughs> Round the lodge in wild disorder, threw the household things about him. Piled together in confusion, bowls of wood and earthen kettles, robes of buffalo and beaver, skins of otter, lynx and ermine, as an insult to Nokomis, as a taunt to Minnehaha. Then departed Paupo Kiwis, whistling, singing through the forest. Then he climbed the rocky headlands, perched himself upon their summit, waiting, full of mirth and mischief, the return of Hiawatha. Full of wrath was Hiawatha when he came into the village, found the people in confusion. Hard his breath came through his nostrils. I will slay this Paupukiwis. Not so long and wide the world is, that my wrath shall not attain him, that my vengeance shall not reach him. Then in swift pursuit departed Hiawatha and the hunters on the trail of Paupukiwis, through the forest where he passed it to the headlands where he rested. But they found not Paupukiwis. Only in the trampled grasses and the whortleberry bushes found the couch where he had rested, found the impress of his body. 
Over rock and over river, thorough bush and brake and forest, ran the cunning Paupok Kiwis. Like an antelope he bounded, till he came upon a streamlet to a dam made by the beavers, to a pond of quiet water, where knee-deep the trees were standing, where the rushes waved and whispered. To the beavers, Paupok Kiwis spake entreating, said in this wise, Oh, my friend, I'll meek the beaver. Cool and pleasant is the water. Very pleasant is your dwelling, oh, my friend, and safe from danger. Can you not, with all your cunning, all your wisdom and contrivance, change me too into a beaver? Then there came a voice of warning from the watchman at his station in the water flags and lilies, saying, Here is Hiawatha, Hiawatha with his hunters. <laughs> then they heard a cry above them heard a shouting and a tramping, and the water round and o'er them sank and sucked away in eddies, and they knew their dam was broken. Down into the pond among them silently sank Paupo Kiwis. Black became his shirt of deerskin, black his moccasins and leggings. In a broad black tail behind him spread his foxtails and his fringes. He was changed into a beaver. But the watchful Hiawatha cried aloud, Oh, powerful Kiwis, vain are all your craft and cunning, vain your manifold disguises. Well, I know you, powerful Kiwis. With their clubs they beat and bruised him, beat to death poor powerful Kiwis, pounded him as maize is pounded, till his skull was crushed to pieces. Six tall hunters, lithe and limber, bore him home on poles and branches, bore the body of the beaver. But the ghost, the jibi in him, thought and felt as Paupok Kiwis, still lived on as Paupok Kiwis, and it fluttered, strove and struggled, waving hither, waving thither, as the curtains of a wigwam struggle with their thongs of deer skin when the wintry wind is blowing, till it rose up from the body, till it took the form and features of the cunning Paupok Kiwis, vanishing into the forest. But the wary Hiawatha saw the figure ere it vanished, glide into the soft blue shadow of the pine trees of the forest, and behind it, as the rain comes, came the steps of Hiawatha. And so near he came, so near him, that his hand was stretched to seize him, but in vain, for Paupo Kiwis sped away in gust and whirlwind, came unto the rocky headlands to the pictured rocks of sandstone, looking over lake and landscape. And the old man of the mountain opened wide his rocky doorways, opened wide his deep abysses, giving Paupo Kiwis shelter in his caverns dark and dreary. There without stood Hiawatha found the doorways closed against him, cried aloud in tones of thunder, Open! I am Hiawatha! But the old man of the mountain opened not and made no answer from the silent crags of sandstone from the gloomy rock abysses. Hey, 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 then he raised his hands to heaven, called imploring on the tempest. And it came with night and darkness, sweeping down the big sea water from the distant thunder mountains, smote the doorways of the caverns, shouted down into the caverns, saying, Where is Paupukiwis? And the crags fell, and beneath them, dead among the rocky ruins, lay the cunning Paupukiwis, slain in his own human figure. Then the noble Hiawatha took his soul, his ghost, his shadow, spake and said, O oh, Paupukiwis, never more in human figure shall you search for new adventures. Never more with jest and laughter dance the dust and leaves in whirlwinds. But above there in the heavens you shall soar and sail in circles. I will change you to an eagle, to canoe, the great war eagle, chief of all the fowls with feathers. And the name of Paupok Kiwis 
lingers still among the people. And in winter, when the snowflakes whirl in eddies round the lodges, when the wind in gusty tumult or the smoke flues, pipes and whistles, there comes Pau Pukiwis. He is dancing through the village. He is gathering in his harvest. Now, o'er all the dreary Northland, mighty Peboan, the winter, breathing on the lakes and rivers, into stone had changed their waters. And the snowflakes, whirling downward, hissed among the withered oak leaves, changed the pine trees into wigwams, covered all the earth with silence. Then with arrows shod with snowshoes, fearing not the evil spirits, forth to hunt the deer with antlers, all alone went Chibiabos. Right across the big sea water sprang with speed the deer before him. O'er the treacherous ice he followed, wild with all the fierce commotion and the rapture of the hunter. But beneath, the evil spirits lay in ambush waiting for him. Broke the treacherous ice beneath him, dragged him downward to the bottom, buried in the sand his body. From the headlands, Hiawatha sent forth such a wail of anguish, such a fearful lamentation, that the bison paused to listen, and the wolves howled from the prairies. Then his face with black he painted. In his wigwam sat lamenting. Seven long weeks he sat lamenting. But disasters come not singly, but as if they watched and waited, scanning one another's motions. First a speck, and then a vulture, till the air is dark with pinions. All the earth was sick and famished. Hungry was the sky above them, and the hungry stars in heaven, like the eyes of wolves, glared at them. Into Hiawatha's wigwam came two silent guests and gloomy, did not parley at the doorway, sat there without word of welcome in the seat of laughing water, looked with haggard eyes and hollow at the face of laughing water. And the foremost said, Behold me, I am famine, Bukatawin. And the other said, Behold me, I am fever, Achosewin. And the lovely Minehaha shuddered as they looked upon her, lay down on her bed in silence, lay there trembling, freezing, burning at the looks they cast upon her. Forth into the empty forest rushed the maddened Hiawatha. In his heart was deadly sorrow, in his face a stony firmness. Wrapped in furs and armed for hunting, with his mighty bow of ash tree, with his quiver full of arrows, on his snowshoes strode he forward. Gitchi Manito, the mighty, give your children food, O oh father. Give me food for Minihaha, for my dying Minihaha. Through the far resounding forest rang that cry of desolation, but there came no other answer than the echo of the woodlands. In the wigwam with Nokomis, with those gloomy guests that watched her, with the famine and the fever, she was lying, the beloved, she the dying Minahaha. Ah! I feel the eyes of Paugu glare upon me in the darkness. I can feel his icy fingers clasping mine amid the darkness. Hiawatha! Hiawatha! And the desolate Hiawatha, far away amid the forest, miles away among the mountains, heard that sudden cry of anguish, heard the voice of Minnehaha calling to him in the darkness. Hiawatha! Homeward hurried Hiawatha, and he rushed into the wigwam, saw the old Nokomis slowly rocking to and fro and moaning, saw his lovely Minnehaha lying dead and cold before him. 
and his bursting heart within him uttered such a cry of anguish that the forest moaned and shuddered, that the very stars in heaven shook and trembled with his anguish. And they buried Minnehaha. In the snow a grave they made her, in the forest deep and darksome, underneath the moaning hemlocks. And at night a fire was lighted for her soul upon its journey to the islands of the blessed. From his doorway, Hiawatha saw it burning in the forest, lighting up the gloomy hemlocks, stood and watched it at the doorway, that it might not be extinguished, might not leave her in the darkness. Farewell, O oh my laughing water. All my heart is buried with you. Soon your footsteps I shall follow, to the island of the blessed, to the kingdom of Punema, to the land of the hereafter. Then it was that in the Northland, after that unheard of coldness, that intolerable winter, came the spring with all its splendour, all its birds and all its blossoms, all its flowers and leaves and grasses. From his wanderings far to eastward, from the regions of the morning, homeward now returned Iago, full of new and strange adventures, marvels many and many wonders. I have seen my friends a water bigger than the big sea water, bitter so that none could drink it. At each other looked the warriors, looked the women at each other smiled and said, It cannot be so! Or it, my friends, all this water came a great canoe with pinions. A canoe with wings came flying, taller than the tallest treetops. <laughs> In it, my friends, came a people. Painted white were all their faces, and with hair their chins were covered. <laughs> And the warriors and the women laughed and shouted in derision like the ravens on the treetops. Only Hiawatha laughed not. True is all Iagu tells us. I have seen it in a vision. Seen the great canoe with pinions. Seen the people with white faces from the regions of the morning. I beheld too in that vision all the secrets of the future of the distant days that shall be. I beheld the western marches of the unknown crowded nations, and the land was full of people, restless, struggling, toiling, striving. In the woodlands rang their axes, smoked their towns in all the valleys. Over all the lakes and rivers rushed their great canoes of thunder. Then a darker, drearier vision passed before me, vague and cloud-like. I beheld our nation scattered, all forgetful of my counsels, saw the remnants of our people sweeping westward, wild and woeful, like the cloud rack of a tempest, like the withered leaves of autumn. From his place rose Hiawatha, Bad farewell to old Nokomis. Bad farewell to all the warriors. Bad farewell to all the young men. I am going, oh my people, on a long and distant journey. Many moons and many winters will have come and will have vanished ere I come again to see you. On the shore stood Hiawatha, turned and waved his hand at parting. On the clear and luminous water, launched his birch canoe for sailing, whispered to it, Westward, westward, westward. And with speed it darted forward, and the people from the margin watched him floating, rising, sinking, till the birch canoe seemed lifted high into that sea of splendor, till it sank into the vapors like the new moon, slowly, slowly sinking in the purple distance. And they said, Farewell forever. And the forests, dark and lonely, 
moved through all their depths of darkness, sighed. Farewell, Hiawatha. Thus departed Hiawatha, in the glory of the sunset, in the purple mists of evening, to the islands of the blessed, to the kingdom of Ponema, to the land of the hereafter. In The Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the storyteller was played by Timothy West and Hiawatha by Chris Garner. Gitchi Manitou was played by Bert Caesar, Little Hiawatha by Sam Fry, and Iago by Chris Harris. Chibiabos was played by Peter Polycarpu, Paupukiwis by Gary Sharkey, and Mudjikiwis by Bill Wallace. Nakomis was played by Mia Sutiriu, Minihaha by Nicole Arumagum, and the chorus by Tom Espiner and Chris Grimes. The music was composed and played by Mia Sutiriu, with pipes played by William Lyons. Technical presentation was by Mike Burgess and Ilsa Laderman, and Hiawatha was produced in Bristol by Viv Beebe and Jeremy Howe. The Song of Hiawatha was abridged for BBC Radio 4's classic serial by Tom Holland.